Hello world. Today on the next episode of the Dark Truth, we have a very special guest here with us today, sitting in the throne under the crown. You know, we only invite kings and queens onto our show, so everybody we invite onto our show, they get to sit in the king chair. You know, and not only is this man a king, but he's actually he's running for office as well. So, what? what's your name? Introduce yourself to the people out there tuning into the dark truth. And uh, let them know who you are and um, what office you're running for. My name is Demario Boone, lifelong Peoria. I uh, work for Peoria Public Schools uh, for school safety. And I'm running for city council at large. Okay, all right. City council at large. At large. Now, what does that title entail? That entails, <laughs> you're not just in one district. You are basically going to be making decisions that affect the whole city. Um, you're going to be representing the whole city. Uh, okay. There is no borders, no boundaries, just pure. Okay. So do you get like a bigger seat down there? Like <laughs> they, give, they give you a crown seat? I, I, wish, I wish. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Still you still, you still, still out there with the district yeah, people? Yeah, uh, yeah, still okay. working with the team. Okay. Yeah, all right, yeah. all right. At large is at large. All right. Well, so how many at large seats are there? Uh, we got five that are up. The re-election coming in February, so uh, I don't know if everybody that's already on their seats are going to rerun, but there's going to be a lot of other candidates, uh, and I just so happen to be one of them. So it's too late for me to get it now. Hey, you, if you got so, you got to Monday, <laughs> to Monday, y'all yeah. uh, hey, get enough signatures out there for me. I ain't, I ain't got the form. Just sign something and get me out there, man. Put me at large. <laughs> Sure, there, man. No, I'm, just, I'm just playing, man. I'm, I'm supporting this guy right here just because I know his views, his values, and he's an honest, upfront guy. So I, I don't even want to run. I put my support behind this guy, but that's another topic. Um, to this art at large seat, though, um, who, who currently holds the seat now? Oh, uh, we got. Five people that are holding at large. I couldn't name them. So, right so it's not a specific right. one you'll get. So, no, it's it's cumulative. So basically, if the top five people that are running get the top five votes, those are the ones that are going to get. Okay. So, okay. if fifty people are running, that top five are going to be the top five again. Do you know how many people are running? Uh, well, nobody in the next week because everybody's okay. going to be turning in their petitions. Okay, so next week, y'all be on the lookout for who are running. He just got to make it in the top five. That's it, right? Yep, top in the five. top five. So if there's only five people running, you automatically in, right? Mm -hmm. But I want to be the top one. Okay, so, well, you want to be the top yeah, one yeah. anyway. So get out there <laughs> and vote. If you want this man in that at-large seat, meaning he's going to be um, making decisions, not just over, you know, the South Side or District 1 or District 2, but... He will be a decision maker over the whole city of Peoria. Now, um, what, what what made you want to run for office? You know, because you you already you say you're safety in um, Peoria Public Schools. Yeah. So uh, if you win, then that job's who, who's going to fill that seat? Like, I mean, you know, I mean, these are hard questions we got to ask. Who's going to fill the seat? Because you're the chief, right? Yeah. yeah you're yeah, the chief. Yeah. Uh, the, the pure public schools officer. Yeah, yeah. So when you say safety, mm -hmm. you and your team, it's your responsibility to keep the kids safe at school. Yep, yeah, yeah. On school property. Mm -hmm. Now, that's a huge responsibility. It is. It is. It is. Huge responsibility. I, I would say it's probably bigger than or just as big as regular police responsibility. Mm -hmm. If not bigger because you got all these kids in the, in the same spot in groups and we already know how things get when you get mm -hmm. groups. So, you know, that's another discussion too, but um, it's a huge responsibility. You you pretty much head honcho in charge. Can't do nothing without your team and I, I know your team. team. Phenomenal the team. team. Is awesome. Phenomenal team. Hopefully, it's you know a team member that you know willing I, to step up and, and fill the shoes. And I'll put your mind at ease. I'm, I'm still gonna be with the district. That's not gonna change. Okay. Um, okay. I I just can't leave that place 
Okay. So you, get to, so you get to do both? I can do both. Okay. Do both. Wow. I'll still be with the district. Wow. Um, and I think my job with the district, what right. I've been doing, led me to think about city council because it feels like city council work anyway. Um, what I mean is, you know, our job is not just keeping kids and staff safe. Like a lot of times now my phone is ringing from parents needing help with housing, needing help with mentoring, needing help with violence and crime in their neighborhoods. Um, I literally just got an email from a lady um, yesterday, um, paragraphs long about violence in her neighborhood and how we can help her with that. How we can help the kids in the area that are just, you know, sitting there and it's, it's a lot of violence that's happening in those spots. But she is reaching out to the school security team wow. to try to help them build bridges and, and fix uh, city so, streets. So she's writing you, not, you haven't even been announced as one of the city council. <laughs> so you're not a council member. I'm not a council member. You're, you're not the mayor. You're not, not the chief of police. No, no. You did, you, you the police officer at the school. Ooh. Yep, and people. And she's writing you about problems that's going on in the community. Yep, and people understand because the team is so invested in the community. Like the officers, I can't say enough about. There's 27 of us, 28 of us now. But I mean, when they do an intervention with a student, they're going into homes, they're finding out needs for the parents, they're putting interventions in place for the parents, they're following up with parents, um, getting services in place, mental health services, like. It's a lot that the team is doing, and I think people are seeing, you know, this is more than just a security team. You know, with our team, I don't, you know, when people say, oh, you're security, I think it's just one piece. Right. You know, we're not security, we're not police, we're something else special. Yeah. You know, and I think yeah. that's something that... Because y'all go above and beyond the yeah. job. Yeah. You go above and beyond the call of duty. Mm -hmm. And obviously the parents see that and they feel that for them to even feel like they could reach out. Mm -hmm. That's that says a lot in itself that, you know, that you're trusted at that level. You know, that that's amazing. So was that part of what inspired you? Like, hey, I need to get in position mm -hmm. where I can actually do more within the community that gives me authority. Yeah. Because authority is a key factor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because when you're you you know, I kind of felt like I was stuck in this limbo. I wanted to help them more. I didn't know what other steps I could do to help more. And then city council, I said, hey, why not be a part of shaping policy and, and doing things to benefit the people that are asking for help most? The people that are sending me these emails, I can do more for them. I can put things in place so they can help them you know, more influential. influential. So that was my steps. So let's talk about Peoria. Peoria has been on a few top lists, not good lists. We we we, we be on some good lists too. Shout out to the people that put us on good lists. But we have been on some some bad lists for the city at large, city as a whole. One of those lists was one of the most violent cities in the country. I think it was like number seventeen or something, and um, we ranked above Chicago. You know, a lot of people are like, what, what, how's that? Well, it's due to per 100,000 yeah, people, per you know, so Chicago got millions of people. If they had 34 homicides per 100,000 people, you do the math. That would go higher than the homicides Chicago had in 2021, because that's how many we had in Peoria, Illinois. 33 of them was African Americans, um, 22 of them were African-American youth. Mm -hmm. What do you see you will be able to bring to Peoria that could change this dynamic of, which has been going on in Peoria? I mean, obviously last year we reached a murder rate higher than we ever, you know, met and, you know, broke records, but the violence in Peoria isn't new. You know, whether if it's 34 or how many we had already this year? 20, 23, 24. 23, 24. Every single homicide is sensitive. Every single one of them is major. It's not a numbers game. You know, these are actual people 
lives that's gone. Mm -hmm. Families are in shambles. Mm -hmm. You know. What can not just you? Because I know the the city council is it's a team. It's a team. Mm -hmm. Don't just falls on the mayor. Don't just falls on you know Denise Jackson or Andre Allen or you know Sid Rodrigo. It, it, mm -hmm. It's a team effort, and usually it's a collective vote. And then you even got the city manager. You got different aspects of the city government, which I was told by a judge is pure as a government, a corporation. You know, uh, y'all will see that interview coming soon too. You know, <laughs> but uh, uh, what honestly would you be able to bring to the table to curb the violence that's going on in Peoria? Yeah, this is really that experience of actually being in the trenches every day, all day, with kids, with families, just bringing that actual real world work experience. Um, like I was born and raised in the South End of Peoria. Uh, it wasn't the same South End that I'm experienced today. Uh, working with Peoria Police Department, working with Peoria Public Schools, I mean, I've been immersed in some of the needs that the families and the kids need. So I think I bring that experience, um, and then also just that root cause work. Like I know that a student coming to school with trauma, there's a lot to unpack. It's not just at that moment, you know, this kid has had trauma. It's bringing that understanding that systemically, and when I mean systemically, that means it was baked in the system in Peoria um, that certain areas were designated hazard areas were stripped of services were stripped of uh, access to to mental health services grocery stores um, places were over police and when you look at places like that south end of peoria east bluff of peoria you can look back and see that those were redlined areas in the 60s and 70s and by redlined areas that means basically areas just carved out for black and poor people and just left to do whatever stripped of services and you carry that on for years and generations, you're gonna have the high poverty, the high crime in those areas because those areas have been neglected. So I think what I'm gonna bring is progressive policies to make sure we address those root cause issues because I understand them and I saw them and I lived them. Um, I've dealt with family members who have dealt with drugs and alcohol, mental health, um, been to prison, got second chances. I've dealt with that. So I want to introduce um, just common sense steps and bring that knowledge to city council that these are the people we need to serve because if these people fail, the city fails. There is no growth after that. There's always going to be a south end somewhere. If it fails, people are going to move up and we don't want that flight that's going to move to Dunlap and all these other areas. We need to address the problems that come first. And I think that's what I'm going to bring to the table. So, um, I heard you say these areas have been red lines since the 60s and 70s. And you're right, there's, there's a south end in every city. There's a south side in every city. And most of the time, it's not good. <laughs> it's not like, oh, you've been to the south side of, of this city and, you know, big houses, mansions, and people with Rolls Royces. And, and no, usually the south side is, you know, the impoverished area. So, that they, they like say they've been red lines for decades. Mm -hmm. um, I remember um, talking to people that used to live on Star Street, you know, for you know, 40, 50 years. They said it was a lot of white people used to live down there mm -hmm. on Star Street, you know, right there. You know, I mean, you go down there now, it's probably maybe one or two, you know, it's, it's definitely not a lot. But uh, there, there are still, you know, white people that you know live on the south end of Peoria and, and on the east bluff of Peoria that suffer from these same systemic, um, you know, impoverished areas that unfortunately they only could afford to live in these areas because most black people I know when they can afford to live out of those areas they move out of those areas, you know. 
I, I got a house in the South End, but I got a house outside the South mm -hmm. End too. You know what I'm saying? But I'm in the South End every day. Like I'm I'm in the hood every day, you know, and and uh unless it's cold outside. I might not be nowhere I'm in the house, you know. <laughs> I gotta work for right, that. Right. That's something making me go outside, you know, that ain't nowhere. Yeah, but uh, but uh why would you say that um changing these areas and bringing you know more economics to these areas will curb the violence that's only happening with a particular group of people in these areas african americans mm -hmm. predominantly but the behavior isn't transcending to the other races hispanics mm -hmm. you know whites other poor people living in these areas. Mm -hmm. I'm really mainly focused on, so I said, you got black, whites, Hispanics, they live in the South of the They're experiencing, you know, the same traumas, the shots fired calls, police, you know, having to go down there every five minutes, you know, dead 15 year olds laying in their neighborhood. Um, the email I got from that parent spoke on me. She's like, you know, we had two kids literally killed on our block something has to change so when i talk about those redlined areas you know for years those areas have systemically been neglected you know and when you do that people can't transfer wealth and, and generation after generation can get locked into this um, government created poverty and that puts people in that fight or flight mode that makes people have to feel like you know do I pay the rent or do I feed my kids? And when you're consistently in that fight mode, if that, that triggers trauma in the brain, then that also goes trauma to the kids. And then when people wonder, you know, why in these specific areas is it just always violent here or whatever? Because people are always just fighting to survive. So when you try to go and, and say, hey, let's go to these specific areas and try to inject some sort of hope you know, making sure that housing is sufficient, making sure that we identify the families in most need of services and put services in place for those families. There are other... Uh, what do you mean by services? There are, other, there are other cities like Baltimore, for instance. They actually have a progressive policy that um, people in their poorest neighborhoods, they get a stimulus. So it could be $500 a month. And some parents say, hey, I use that $500 a month for babysitting. I use that $500 a month for um, helping tutoring with my kid. I use that $500 a month to help supplement and pay my rent because I'm working two or three jobs and I can't watch my kids. And, you know. and that gives them the opportunity to be home with their kid mm -hmm. instead of having to go work two or three jobs because parenting is actually being involved with your kids' mm -hmm. lives. You can monitor them. You can educate them. You can groom them to do the right thing mm -hmm. more instead of the world being yeah. that influence. And you got a lot of people that are living in the South of the Peoria, white, black, Hispanic, that are working, you know, jobs that they are paying over 50% of their salary in their mortgage or their rent. You know what I mean? I couldn't imagine paying that much. I think that's a great, a great idea. We say Baltimore? Baltimore's doing it. That's a great idea. Shout out to Baltimore yeah. government. Ev Evanston, Illinois. They have a, a, a package that they do too. Shout out to Evanston, Illinois. Sometimes, you know, you know it could be 24 months you, you help a family like that and then you get more involved. Now, right? now, now, what about the fear of enabling people to not work harder, but work smarter? Mm -hmm. You know, because there is that 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 little niche that negativity that comes from someone else paying your bills and making you feel comfortable a lot of people will say mm -hmm. you know that enables people to let the government take care of them mm -hmm. and then they never accomplish their goals and they they stay because you only can obviously make a certain amount of money to qualify yep. for these things so yep. that means you have to keep your ambitions low and your dreams low and your jobs low mm -hmm. in order to qualify for this extra funding. Mm -hmm. Or you can find a way to think smarter, make more money doing less work. A lot of people do do that. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are successful at that. 
So, in, 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 when, so when you talk about the fight or flight mm -hmm. um, mode, I remember getting in a lot of fights mm -hmm. and then becoming friends with the people I was fighting because usually we fighting over petty beef, mm -hmm. but nowadays for our community, they're, they're not fighting, like they're shooting and killing each other. So I think that's a little different than a fight or flight mode because you're in the murder mode. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and, and by fight or flight mode, I mean, you know, when I'm consistently on edge, whether I'm gonna lose my house, I'm gonna be homeless, I'm in an area where I can't let my kids play outside because shots are- So what fire. do you think is the different mechanism that a, a African American kid resort to murdering somebody suffering from these same systemic conditions than a white kid or a Hispanic kid. And then not only is they murdering somebody, but they're willing to murder their own. Mm -hmm. Another poor person that's going through the exact same struggle mm -hmm. you're going through. Yeah, and I think that that comes with, um, and that would almost be like a scientific method if somebody could predict that, but I think that comes along with how long you're in that. How long you're in that. Well, I mean, most of these kids are the same because age. Though, I, so. I, I get it, but a it's like me. It's like me blaming a, a white man for slavery when I never felt the whip right. of, on my back. I, I've never yeah. picked any cotton. I've only been here for so many amount of years. Mm -hmm. I've only been in poverty for so many yeah. amount of years. So a 15-year-old black kid and a 15-year-old white kid, both born and raised in poverty mm -hmm. only but, both but been we, experiencing but, but we have to understand this poverty that, for the same amount of time yeah a 15 year old white kid and a 15 year old black kid could be born south of the peoria same amount of poverty but one still <laughs> systemically has more power than the other in the eyes of other people like they're still going to look at that black kid as more of a threat in certain instances. That black kid is gonna be treated less than in a lot of instances. There's a lot of things that, even if I can put those kids together, they have the same type of upbringing, the same kind of money, society doesn't weigh them the same. So that black, just like black police officers versus white police officers, I was a pure police officer. I went through the same police academy and I went through the same training on the department as white officers. I had more systemically against me working in that department. It was harder for me to make it over than a white officer. And you could probably ask black officers today, they all probably say, yeah, we went through a little more because there's more weighing on me. So what helped you get through that, become who you are when nobody's under your belt? Right, right. I, 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 if you got anybody, don't tell them about it. <laughs> but I'm so you ain't had to murder nobody. No. Like you said, you grew up on the south side mm -hmm. of Missouri mm -hmm. in poverty. It looked like you're not in poverty no more. I mean, you're probably, <laughs> I ain't not, rich. You're probably not rich. Me yeah, neither. Yeah. I ain't rich either. You know, if I was, I would tell y'all. But um, you definitely don't look like you're in poverty. Mm -hmm. So. I definitely and, and, have, and, and I, I'm pretty I, sure you you still want to grow higher, obtain I do. more I do. Uh, wealth, you know, mm -hmm. generational wealth to pass down, keep your kids from having to suffer and go through certain things that you you had the experience as a child, mm -hmm. just from the systemic poverty that we know is imbalanced right, right. in this country. Mm -hmm. You know, even 2022 mm -hmm. is still a imbalance in you know um, jobs. Yeah. Um, Becoming a lawyer, becoming a cop, becoming a judge, be becoming anything, you know, the decision makers usually at the top are non-African American. Right. You know? And that's why I said systemically, it's gonna be harder right. for somebody and, and, with our shade. And, and that and and, and, and that, that that definitely makes sense why someone might commit a crime like mm -hmm. home invasion mm -hmm. or, or burglary. Yeah, I'm not excusing which, any of that because, like I said, you, right. you pointed out, I grew up without any bodies under them. I also right. had a, a grandfather and a grandmother that didn't play. I had to run home when the lights came on outside, street lights came on. I'm the only one on Proctor Street running down to my, my house. 
You know what I mean? Because I knew I was going to get tore up. You said the only one. I was the only one. I would I'm take out off. Here. That thing would cut on. I would take off. But I had that kind of parent. And he just, yeah. my grandparents was like, they didn't play. Yeah. They didn't play. They were in the. Uh, so you was the, raised by your grandparents? Mm-hmm. Okay. mm-hmm. And they were in the lodge, so like a lot of people that uh, my brother and I were around were like older people, yeah. wiser people. Yeah. So you know, we so you had, had a lot of wise role models. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I, and then you know, I had people that I looked up to, like uh, Chief John Stenson. He would come over to the house because he and my grandfather were extremely close, and like I got to see those things. And when I got to see myself in those roles, it made it a lot easier for me. A lot of times now, these kids don't get to see themselves in those roles anymore. Those uh, they don't those got mentors, good role models. Those role models are not there. They got you know people that are celebrities and music and stuff like. That. A lot of that stuff is not the most positive way to right. walk, and you know those end up becoming their role. Those models. end up becoming their role models, and they model something that some of these rappers ain't even really living. Right. They're not really living that. Right. But these kids, but think, there are some that is. There's a, there like, are some. There's that a lot is. of rappers like that. There's like dead now. Mm-hmm. It's not actually going back to their hood and like, living it. But yeah, I mean, I mean, but even like you know, um, takeoff. You know, rest mm-hmm. in peace, takeoff. You know, he was just killed in a mall. Mm-hmm. Like you and, know, and, 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 and it's so part common. of the, and it's it's like it's a part of the culture in in people mental black people mental against other black people that if someone disrespects me in any form of fashion, I have almost the right to murder you or start to use a gun to start shooting at you you know and when it comes to poverty we understand uh, even when you're middle class you're still poor I'm poor Mm -hmm. okay nobody say I'm poor Mm -hmm. (laughs) I don't care about the chain none of the rings the diamonds look I'm I'm poor Mm -hmm. if I'm if you're not rich you're poor in, in my book, that's my book. I'm not saying that's how it is, but the, to me, the middle class is is, a, is an illusion mm-hmm. because can you not get up and have to go to work every day? Yeah, I definitely do. You have to every day. <laughs> every day. If you don't, you can oh, slip and easily be right back on the south. Are maybe <laughs> one or two checks away. One or two checks from the south. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or, or, or homelessness. Or, or you can't even afford to live on the south. You, you in the shelter, yeah. you you know what I'm saying? So Yeah, that's know. why I wanna to get to those root cause issues and address those because you know, when when the least of us or, or the people that are in most need or people that look about, oh they're the least of these or whatever, when they're lifted up the city's gonna be a lot better. You know, when we see businesses thriving in the south and the Peoria, when we see a grocery store within walking distance of people in South Peoria, you know, I, my first job was Kroger on Harmon Highway. You know, wow. and that was our Kroger. Wow. You know, every Saturday, Sunday, my grandparents went there, went shopping. Now you got people that now there's not a grocery store. Don't have a grocery shopping. store in that area. Like that should be normal. Now, I know a little bit about the grocery industry and food deserts, mm-hmm. and it's you know I've been talking to um, Pastor Chuck Brown, who is working on mm-hmm. getting you know, the grocery store, getting there. the grocery store down there, and it's not easy, mm-hmm. especially when you're in what they're calling food deserts. Mm-hmm. So I understand what you're saying about bringing that economic value up to places. It, it brings in more retailers, more businesses. It makes it sustainable for a grocery store to survive in a food desert. Yeah, South you know? Peoria should not be going to Dollar Tree or a grocery or um, a gas station or a liquor store for groceries. Right. Like you're not gonna get healthy choices there. You know, you're not gonna get choices that you know everybody else in North Peoria or whatever gets. And again, it's just like that that you know, that red line. Like these people in these areas don't need these same basic resources. And right. we have to eliminate that. Right. Like it has to be that everybody has to be treated fairly and equitably. And that means that we need to make sure that the people on the South End and East Bluff have the same access to mental health, groceries, as somebody up north. And that's why I kind of like the out at large role because I'm not going to be just married to one area. Like we're going to be talking about Peoria as a whole. And if Peoria as a whole is not going to be uh, taken care of together, then I'm going to make a lot of people uncomfortable. Because so that's you have no problem making people. I have no problem when it comes to 
where I grew up, South Peoria, the people that I talk to at East Bluff, the kids that I, I serve with the district, I have no problem wrestling for this, for the family, for them. Not at all. Well, uh, anything, I mean, this, this interview has been, been phenomenal. It's been great talking to you. Uh, I, I just want to say um, it's great that, that you're running. You know, I feel like you bring a lot to the, a lot to the table. I, I, I believe you you see the problem as a whole. You try to include all the components in because it, 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 it does take a community. It, it does take multiple um, solutions to a problem that is caused by multiple yep. different, we'll, we'll call them systems, mm -hmm. not one system, yeah. multiple different mm -hmm. systems. That's, when we say system, we're not talking about like the white man or racism, right. but right. we're talking about, it could just be corporate. Yep. It could just be about money. You know, that's black, white, Chinese, yep. Saudi Arabian, you know, <laughs> India, you know, it, it's, you know, that corporate interest sometimes outweigh the little guy. And, you know, people get forgot about in a lot of classism. Yep. You know, it's just keep poor people poor, rich people rich, yeah. and those people in the middle, you know, and it's just my mindset with being on the city council is making sure that everyone is represented. Yeah. The richest person right. and the poorest person. Equal. That everyone is represented equally. Um, there, there's always this picture, I don't know if you ever saw it, where they show the kids looking over the gate or the fence to watch a game and they say, this is you know, not equitable, where there's a short kid who's just staring at the fence, the taller kid is the only one who can see over the fence, and there's a, a kid in the middle and he's just barely seen over the fence. And then they put a box underneath all of them and all of them are looking over and it says this is equitable. So the smaller kid needed two boxes, the kid in the middle maybe needed one box, and the taller kid didn't need a box. And everybody looked at that one and said, oh, that's an awesome depiction. And I'm like, no, it's not done yet. Take the fence away. Right. That's what we really want to do, is right. take the fence away as a whole. That way I don't need to put a box here, box here, box Everybody is seeing what they need to do. Right. And that's what the mindset I want to carry into being on city council. Now, I had an idea that I had pitched for um, the Safety Network mm -hmm. Committee about bringing a major production studio mm -hmm. on the south side of Peoria. That would be awesome. I mean, kid, like, I know the kids at the schools, we have so many kids that are musically talented. And so many parents now, I think at the board meetings, parents were talking about making sure we keep the arts in schools Make sure that everybody has access to the arts. I would love the South End to be a hub for the arts. I would love it. I would love it. And not only for the arts, but our only condition would be for you to make music that uplifts your community. Awesome. Instead of destroying it. Yep. And will work. Mm -hmm. That's our only condition. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously you got to have some type of talent too. Yeah, like, yeah. This can't be enough. <laughs> <laughs> like you know, like I'm not trying to do that. So yeah. <laughs> I might have a little off. <laughs> but but I, I think it would be awesome. I mean, it's it's needed. Um, music is a big part of some of these issues that's making it, you know, making it in our minds and in the system that okay, if I have a beef with somebody, this is how I handle it. And then even some of the rappers that are living that life, you know, that, that have sadly passed. You know, when they brag about the bodies they had, and people are just singing along to them. Those are families of hurting people that everybody's just singing and whatever to and just vibing to. Like, that's that puts something in people's heads. Right. So, music is. Do you, do you see that in any other culture? I have not witnessed a country song talking about. <laughs> I haven't. I might make one just wrong. for the fun of it, just to, to no, nah, I ain't gonna do that. Uh, yeah, I, I ain't gonna I, make, I ain't gonna make people mad. I, I, I do that enough. I can't think of one. Yeah, but it, I mean, it's it's really prevalent in our culture, and then of course when you tie the money, everything to it, somebody young that's when it start getting is gonna see. That's when it start to become a system. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah. Now, let's say the system is behind that. Mm -hmm. How much power as the artist? Mm -hmm as the individual, as the consumer mm -hmm. have 
to get rid of this narrative. Man, if there's a powerful system, a corporation that's over it, it's gonna be very hard <laughs> to get rid of because the the you know the tail doesn't wag the dog. So I mean these big corporations that are saying, okay, this is what the type of artist I want, this is the type of music we're gonna fund, and this is the type of I own the radio station. I can put that song out on a loop and, and do it over and over. Did you ever used to wear a Mitchell and Ness jersey? Oh man, I I wore so much stuff. And I who was, who 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 single handedly stopped everybody from wearing Mitchell and Ness jerseys? I don't, I don't know. Look at that. I don't wear jerseys now. I wear button ups. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. Jay Z. Oh, he said he said that, and everybody stopped wearing jerseys. Man, I, I definitely still got my magic jersey. Mitchell, Mitchell, Mitchell. Yes. but yes. I mean, but, but you remember how much jerseys used to be the trend? Mm -hmm. But, but that's, the power, that's the power of music. Somebody can come in and destroy a whole trend. The power of music bridged the gap between races. Mm -hmm. When you had the white side and the black side, you get in the concert, and the music will bring them together. And now these so-called racist white kids, they going home to their dad like, dad, you lied. Mm -hmm. I just partied with a black guy and it was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> you know, these people are awesome, dad. You said they were crazy, you you lied. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? They, they're real, real nice. They're real. Well, we tie a lot of our culture, hip hop culture stuff to music. And yeah. we tie that and say that's our culture. Right. You know, when growing up, I was a big fubu guy. I wore so much fubu, but it was like, you know, I, I could see tied to, you know, they put LL Cool J as right. one of the big football guys. Right. And because LL was wearing it, the way he was rocking it, you know, that was where I wanted to follow. Right. And I see now that that can control a lot of trend. Do it control people. you as much as an adult? No. Not as an adult because now, you know, my brain is developed and I can cognitively think about these things. Right. But when you are putting this into kids at, from birth to darn near their 20s, like the human brain does not finish developing until right. you're mid to late twenties. Right. There's so, a so lot it, of so conditioning. This this message was developed oh, yeah. into their brain. Yeah. Their brain is still developing, and everything you put in it is actually developing into your brain and developing into who you are mm -hmm. becoming. And when you're someone black, I feel like that's my culture. That's the way I'm going to go and do things. So you know, I like food because I like food. Right. But you know, they know that. Let's put a, an artist in front of this because of their music, because of the influence the music, that they could right. have. You know, I remember when the music has blown up a lot of brands. Yeah, yeah. Burberry. Burberry. Yeah. Uh, this really ain't a real one. But uh, <laughs> I, I mean, I remember as a kid, like we wore baggy jeans all the time. Everything's baggy, right. you know. And then I remember when Criss Cross came out. I wore a backwards shirt, like. Because Chris Cross did it. Me and too. I, I'm sad I'm a I'm busy. Selling jump, jump, yeah. The Mac Data making. Yeah. But everything was baggy. <laughs> and then uh, freaking what, Lil Wayne, a bunch of guys got up on stage with the real skinny jeans. With the skinny jeans. The skinny jeans. Look, I tried in. hard to avoid the skinny jeans <laughs> movement. Right. I tried hard. But when you go to the store and you need something to wear and they like this, all we got, yeah. sir. Yeah. And you start looking at it and saying, oh well, you know, it controls the trend. Pulling these skinny jeans on and yeah. look, my skin, I jeans ain't that skinny today. I'm still yeah. trying to stay up here, but it, it ain't it ain't easy. You and know? we just talking about clothing at that point. So have now an you alternative. Put a message. So have yeah. an alternative. Yeah. It's huge. Now you tie a message to that. <laughs> That's all other animal. Then you raise your people. You know somebody just told me um TikTok is owned by what, China? Or Japan, one of those. Uh, it one of them. They said in in China, um, all they shown they TikToks is stuff about astrology, astronomy, supreme mathematics. Like, but when you go past our news feed, all you see is people dancing and cracking jokes. Mm -hmm. Social media is a whole other man. You have yeah. a whole other hour dealing. But with if that. you think about music, mm -hmm. it's tied into that as well. Yeah, it is. All of it is tied. All this time. It's Music is incorporated in every aspect of the entertainment business from the NBA, NFL, I mean, um, movies have soundtracks, T TV shows, reality shows have soundtracks. Yep. 
the music has the power to control your emotions and open you up. Mm -hmm. And that's the biggest thing, is your emotions. Um, one of the things that my Andrew said, people forget what you said, they'll never forget how you made them feel. So wow. that emotion, wow. you tie emotion to every, that's why movies don't play without music. You know, I So do you think as a people we are too emotional sometimes? I'm a very emotional person. We, I'm an emotional guy. <laughs> I'm just damn. Me too. So I, but is it but is it good to act off emotions? It it could be good and bad because emotionally, with my passion, I'm acting off of that in a positive way to run for. So oh, good emotions mm -hmm. is good to act because I get tired. of What about fear? Fear. Uh, that, you got to be measured with that. What about anger? You got to be very measured. You know, anger, fear is almost like, you know, smoke. You know, smoke can kill you. You know, you gotta be careful with it still. But anger is fire. You definitely gotta make sure that that fire not spread. You gotta contain it. So what you're saying is you gotta learn to master your you emotions. You have to, you have to. And, that, and that's the biggest issue with what we're dealing with kids is you know, cognitively, they're not ready to deal with it. Right, and we can't have that high expectation for you them to already be mastered. When we ain't already mastered ours, ours all the you way. You just surf <laughs> Facebook and you will look at all the grown people that they bully each other. Right. And then we're trying right. to get kids to look right. at their pages and then not do that. Right. And you wonder why 18 year olds are shooting 15 year olds. So is this message here for the kids or is it for you grown folks? <laughs> I mean, you look, you can surf and you will see adults that can't handle conflict well. Right. They argue with each other back right. and forth. You know, right. they can't handle conflict right. well. We bully one another. Right? And these are adults. My, my, my motto has always been keep emotions out of it. If we're trying to come to something that involves everyone, then it has to be based off logic, common sense, evidence, facts. You know what I'm saying? Those things, nothing to do with emotions. Take your ego out, take your pride out, take your sadness, your fear, your anger, take all of that out of the equation because you can't really think and focus clearly when you're emotional. And that's even when you're happy. Like, I'm having a good time, yo. They like, Joe, they said, come over here and do this interview, Joe, for Vibe Magazine. Oh, Joe, we partying. You know what I'm saying? All right, well, Vibe left. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, so even good emotions can can have its its downfall. So you know, being able to master your emotions and leave them out of certain things, like they'll tell you in politics, you can't really bring your emotions to the table. You know, as a, as yeah, a, there's a lot of times I know if if I do get this position, there's going to be a lot of times I'm going to be at that horseshoe and I'm going to be very angry right. because historically. Just seeing where we are now with South Peoria, East Bluff, and being on this worst place for African Americans list, one of the most violent place list, I'm not going to be happy unless we're off of it. And I'm gonna be uncomfortable, and there's gonna be things I wanna say at that horseshoe, or stuff that I, I, I wanna yell about, or, or argue with somebody. To get the job done, I have to still be measured, but I have to be passionate about getting the job done. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's that balance. But I'm 40. So at 40, I can I can process that yeah. and not piss you, nobody you, you out and jump across. You have mastered your emotions better than you probably was when yeah. you was 15. So. Man, at 15. I or even 25. Right. You know, 25, 30. I was still not there. Yeah. I wasn't, yeah. you know, so it's. At 40, so we probably need there. to be more patient with these kids. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, and I as, see as, it, as a dope. And I see that I see that a lot in you, with the way you deal with kids. You're mm -hmm. very calm. You're very reserved. It takes a lot to get a a a, 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 a rise out of you. Mm -hmm. You know, and we need that type of leadership around our kids because I'm pretty sure they're getting yelled at yeah. and, and 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 you know probably talked down to, and that's probably causing some of the trauma and mm -hmm. stuff. And, they and I wasn't always like that in uniform. You know, right. when I first started, I didn't understand these things about, you know, student adolescent development, you know, kids, how their brains develop, how trauma carves neural pathways in the brain. Right. You know, if a kid is growing up and just sees two parents always fighting and arguing, they have a disagreement, they physically fight, um, they scream, they yell, 
that car that carves trauma in their neural pathways. So when something happens to them, their brain automatically goes to that. This is what happens. Right. This is how I resolve conflict, and it takes counseling and a lot of things to carve new neural pathways in there to learn how to resolve it the right way. So when and I started, you learn it. You when I started learn learning those things and started reading those things and going to all these trainings, when a kid would cuss me out stuff like that, bothered me because I was like, "There's a root cause. Right. There's a reason this is happening." Right. And it could be a kid cussing me out, and I'm like, "When we done, we, we gonna talk afterwards." It could be a kid I took in custody. You know, it cussed me, F12, F this, F, F that. Uh, then I, I would wish. sit back, so, let like, them vent, and they say, okay, what, what is the root cause issue? And those you turn into some of the best interventions. You find out something ain't going on right now. They can ready to lose the house. They can ready, They need rent paid. And we put those services in place that I would have missed had I just been like, you know what, like me. And that's what we need. We need people that's willing to grow within themselves and become better people so they can be better for their community. So I commend you on that. I commend you for running for office too. That's not an easy thing. It's a huge responsibility, a burden that you, you're saying you're willing to take on. So I commend you for that and all the work you're doing with the community. Thanks for coming on to the Dark Truth. Appreciate you. You know, um, we, we only, like I said, invite kings and queens on here. This is a king, man. Treat him as such. You know what I mean? And if he's um, in office, when, matter of fact, when he's in office, just know he'll be there working for the city at large and not just the district. So you can come to this man, whatever district and part of the city you you in with your problems, say, hey, these are issues we have and can you help? Thank you for coming on to Mario Boone. Appreciate you as, as, as a brother and as a man helping our community going above and beyond it to reach the youth too, man. Thank you. Thank you. Swore, man. Thank y'all for tuning in. Uh, we'll be back with a uh, commercial break and our special words from our sponsors. Thanks, man. Thank you, bro. I appreciate you. Thank you, man. Good, good interview, man. You good? You good? You good under pressure? So number one don't sound that hot mm. Feeling like Diddy probably felt the day he found the lock It's all about the Benjamin, so please sign on the dotted line and climb. Your way up out this hole, I'm about to put you in climb. It's kinda like get out that place you sunk in climb. It's time to up the price, make sure you touch and in climb. That industry door, my ninjas is busting in Touching M's, crypto the currency you never touch again Digital, these times are pivotal, woe is rushing in Leading the pack of soldiers, he got enough of them First the money, everybody under the cover, nigga yeah. Until the top of the game, we running in I can even get contracts from the government This being on God's side, then yeah, I'm loving it If you fall, keep trying, push through all the struggle and climb One step at a time, you gon' be fine, you gotta climb Stay up on your hustle and your grind, you gotta climb your biggest power muscle is your mind, you gotta climb They told you you was nothing, they was lying, homie, climb One step at a time, you gon' be fine, you gotta climb Stay up on your hustle and your grind, you gotta climb Your biggest power muscle is your mind, you gotta climb They told you you was nothing, they was lying, homie, climb The first tree to climb was the tree of love and peace The other tree was trying to convince you to run the street Knock a Glock back and rock a